Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. I'm not going to lie, I do feel a bit awkward. I've never walked into a work holiday party being the only one dressed up, but uh, today is, I guess, technically the first. Why would you guys leave me out in the lurch like this? You know it's the last one. I didn't know we were doing this. It's the last episode before Christmas and the holidays. Have we done that before? Yeah. Oh. (laughs) I think so. Have we not? I don't, my memory doesn't go that far back. I'm just amazed I got here and didn't forget Hank. Like, don't expect too much of me, honestly. (laughs) We've, uh, you know what? I think, I didn't think the next stage of the podcast growth would be uh, daycare. Here we are. I could have sworn it was going to be any some kind of content or, you know, whatever. Maybe hiring a full-time producer, whatever it might be. Um, but no, daycare is, a, I guess, a lucrative step. Have you seen what they charge for daycare around here? Wait, are we billing anything? Soon we can uh, just no, have you... our parents in the house, too, and it can be like a senior citizen's uh, old <laughs> retirement home. Hey, careful. Martha's going to hear this, and she's not going to like being called a senior citizen. <clears throat> That's true. Well, don't be old then. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, ungrateful son. (laughs) Says the guy on the wrong side of 30. Yeah. Folks, welcome to the Winged Wheel podcast, the last episode before the holiday break. If you hear a commotion downstairs, that's none other than the human cannonball, Hank Crisco, hanging out with uh, Mel down there. We are here to talk to you about all things Red Wings hockey, the world of the NHL, uh, and everything else uh, before the holiday break. I am one of your hosts, Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Crisco. And I'm Evan. Evan the bad son. Apparently. I'm gonna, Apparently. I'm going to message her. Don't do it. <laughs> I'll message your mom and it'll be way Oh, no, worse. no, no. Okay, okay. Hold on. Let's <laughs> not get crazy. Hey, hey Martha, Evan called you uh, old. Um, hey, Ryan's mom, uh, he's still not a doctor. <laughs> no, I would say I got accepted to medical school. No. I'm sorry your son is such a failure. No. <laughs> My God. On this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast, we're going to be talking about anything other than that. Uh, the Red Wings have played two games of uh, wildly different tones, the 4-3 OT loss against the Capitals, and then the 7-4. It's always like seven goal games against Tampa Bay, it feels. Uh, the 7-4 win against Tampa Bay. Uh, we'll talk about their game being postponed against Ottawa on Friday and what that means for the team other than going into the break with a massive W. Uh, there's some news, you know, just talking about the Red Wings. Jacob Rana seems to be getting closer. Uh, Philip Ronick is starting to get recognized league-wide. For his efforts and the Red Wings made a low level but still you know notable trade uh, over the past couple of days uh, we will be discussing oh actually we have uh, Max Boltman on this episode of the Wings Wheel podcast to just give an overview of where the Red Wings are at heading into the holiday break and just using this as a as a benchmark moment where we say is this Red Wings team serious how does this compare to where they were at Thanksgiving what's the trajectory like so really great discussion with Max uh, and then we will talk about some NHL news before jumping into overtime. Before all that, I do want to let you know, Winged Wheel Podcast Night at the LCA is a fantastic last-minute Christmas gift for someone if you are still hoping to get them something. Winged Wheel Podcast Night at the LCA is on Saturday, April 8th. It's our second one of the season. It's our fourth one we've ever run. Uh, it's an event run in partnership with the, with the Detroit Red Wings, and it is in benefit of the Jamie Daniels Foundation so what it is, is we host a live episode of the Winged Wheel podcast uh, before the game. So we've done it at the arena. We've done it at Hockey Town Cafe because so many hundreds of you came out uh, that we needed a bigger space. Uh, and it has featured special guests like Ken Daniels and Mickey Redmond. Uh, there's merch, there's giveaways, there's prizes, uh, food and drinks. There's um, a Q&A period where you can ask the host or more importantly, the special guests, whatever questions you want, uh, meet and greet as well. And then we all head to the game and uh, watch the Red Wings play. So it'll be against Pittsburgh. They are discounted tickets. You get a special Winged Wheel podcast discount. Uh, Additionally, you sit in a Winged Wheel podcast specific section. So if you like to sit close to the ice, we have lower bowl sections. If you uh, like the gondola, the view that Ken and Mick have, we have the entire gondola booked out for you. Upper bowl sections as well. Uh, So that is DetroitRedWings.com slash WWP. A portion of the proceeds uh, from every ticket sold goes directly to the Jamie Daniels Foundation. So again, DetroitRedWings.com slash WWP. We haven't even officially announced this on Twitter or anything yet. We're already at uh, almost 200 tickets sold. So uh, if you want your tickets and you want your uh, first choice as to where to sit, go to DetroitRedWings.com slash WWP. Uh, 
My parents will be coming. No kidding. My dad is a, we have family friends in Michigan. So my parents, my dad specifically said he wanted to go, which is very unheard of my father. That's I, he's a very perimeter guy. Oh yeah. My dad too. Um, so yeah, my parents are going to come. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Why don't we start by talking about the Red Wings two games? The first one against Washington. That was a game where Owe came in with 800 goals. Gordie Howe has 801 career goals, and Derek Lalone was noted as telling the team before the game, hey, essentially don't be part of history. Do whatever you can to make sure that you are not on these highlight reels, you are not part of the history books today, and it means a little something because Gordie Howe, obviously the greatest Red Wing of all time, one of the most, the greatest hockey players of all time, notably in the winged wheel, uh, just protect the legacy for a little bit longer. Does it mean anything in practice? No. Does it mean anything emotionally, which is all the sport is? Yeah. We talked about this last episode. So a lot of negatives that game, but hey, the Red Wings held Ovi off. Yeah, they had a very interesting strategy of by simply, by simply allowing every other Washington capital to shoot as much as they wanted, Ovi would then shoot less. And it worked. They sold out hard on Ovi. Like, oh, yeah. It's as if I, Evan and I it, were... It would be like intentionally walking a guy who's going for the home run record. 100%. And you know, I think Ovi still ended up with like five or six shots or something like That's that. That's low by his standards. It is. But they they shut down lanes. They collapsed on him when the puck got to him. And do you know what? Even Vili Husso was... He was sliding across the street cheating towards Ovi. And that's not even bad strategy either because you know... You have to cheat a little bit when a guy can shoot like that. And you know that he, they are forcing every shot to Ovechkin right now, period. Not that the Washington Capitals aren't interested in winning, but almost their first priority right now, balancing how talented their team is, the kind of injuries they have. They've almost publicly said, like, our first priority is Ovechkin catching Gretzky for this record. So for Vili Husso to cheat across the net a little bit and just get a, an advance on that lateral slide to stop the, the, the puck when Ovi shoots, it was smart. I mean, obviously I mean, he was going to shoot. I mean, as a goalie, you're even in normal circumstances, your only hope to stop an OV one timer is you have to first beat the pass there. And then secondly, pray it hits you because you're not saving it. You're not throwing a glove up, throwing you're just got to get there before the pass and then hope he hits you because you can't move fast enough to save that even if you're in position. So, no. So let's talk about uh, the other good points. Also, Ovi only was registered with three actual shots on goal, which I think is a little low, but hey, it's their scorekeeper. Uh, the good parts of the game started early. The Red Wings actually opened scoring. David Perron picked up a puck where it was essentially like a Larkin desperation jab. He's like, oh, the puck's coming over here. Swung out the stick. It ended up being knocked in front. And one of those small plays, but really deft, really impressive plays. If you are a person who... Uh, is maybe newer to the game and says, what makes the difference between someone who can just put the puck in the net compared to someone who seems like a, they never get a break or they grip their stick too hard? Watch what David Perron does when he sees a loose puck in front here. He has a millisecond to think about it and less than a millisecond to act. Quick forehand, backhand, roof. Like just really nimble, uh, really effective. It's a simple move. A lot of guys can do it, but to do it at that speed with that reaction... That's what the veteran experience and a guy who can produce brings you. I really like that goal from David Perron. It's literally what they brought him here for. Yeah. Is, you know, the Red Wings are a team that have severely lacked finishing over the last several seasons, to put it lightly. Uh, so you expect a guy like David Perron put in a position like that to finish more often than he does, and, and that was perfect. Uh, also in the first period, Berggren with the puck out behind the net did a really fantastic job uh, finding Oscar Sunquist in front. Valeno also got an assist on that play, and that was just another moment where everyone went, oh, wow, great pass by Berggren. Just like talk about guys who were brought in for that specific reason, that's him displaying, and we've talked about it ad nauseum on the show, his playmaking ability, his ability to just kind of use his hockey IQ, and whether it be a simple pass like that or, or uh, you know something a little bit more difficult, Berggren is very, very able to to create those plays and uh, not the easiest pass in the world, but really good job by Sonny, who does a good job up front uh, to to go up to nothing. And that was a game that was looking good for Detroit at that point. 
Yeah, I got a hot take on Beargren. Go for it. I think he might be pretty good. <laughs> it was a smart pass. He's like not a perfect player. Like he still has a ways to go. Obviously, a lot of guys do. Think of how you know we've watched Valeno progress, or or a lot of other young guys, even Raymond Insider at points. But no, he like he's not lost. At no point has that been quashed so far. His uh, his playmaking ability or his his moments where he makes Brad have a hot take like Beargren is actually good at hockey. Yeah. The thing that I love about what Beargren's done since he's been recalled is he hasn't tried to modify his game. He knows what he is. He knows what his strengths are, and he doesn't care that he jumped up level. He's still leaning on those. Because you see guys come out and, you know, the pace gets faster. So Beargren, notoriously a guy who likes to really slow the play down, a guy like that would speed up at the NHL level thinking he needs to speed up. Beargren's having none of that. He, he still has the mindset of it's my puck until I deem otherwise. And when I deem otherwise, it's going to be on someone else's stick in a prime scoring area. Yep. And then things start to go south for Detroit. I don't think that they were good from the second period onwards in this game. Oh, God, no. It was That was a game where a lot of fans were venting their frustrations. And especially on the heels of the previous five losses, they were thinking, what's going to happen with this team moving forward? Uh, it's really disheartening. It's it's one thing when you can see a team being outclassed at the start of a game because, you know, their captain's injured, one of their most important defensemen is playing, just recovering from pneumonia, which if you've ever had it, it takes the lungs and legs right out of you, even when you're better. Uh, it, it's one thing if they start losing that game right off the, the hop, but to have a good 20 minutes for the most part and then just completely fall apart like that, that it was it was crummy to see. The only other positive point that kind of came in that game was... Uh, it was basically off a, pay, a play again where Ovi was cheating because he wanted the goal, took a risky move to try and, and create a chance. The Red Wings turned it around, and Kopp and Raymond, who have had a good connection this year, went down the ice, Kopp found Raymond, and Raymond made no mistake, held for just long enough and buried it uh, on his off wing. Uh, but that was it. That was the extent of Detroit's you know, success. They gave up uh, a two-goal lead. They gave up a 3-2 lead and ended up losing in OT as Dmitry Orlov finished it. So... In a game where Vili Husso, I think, wasn't bad, I think he was good, they lost. And they got thoroughly outplayed while doing so. It's it, They're actually okay to have walked away with just a point there. Like That is, I would say, a fortunate outcome considering they had 40-plus minutes of pretty poor play. Considering the Red Wings have had zero points in the last five games, the fact that they even got one trending in the right direction and uh, clearly paid off in the next game as well. Yeah, that's the that's the optimist view of it. That's not typically my viewpoint. No, and I got to tell you, after watching that game, I, it was hard for me to be too optimistic. I wasn't, you know, banging the table or anything, like really pissed off. But I was like, more of the same, considering the position this team is in. Um, in the interview that you're going to hear soon that I recorded with Max, that was after the Washington game. So um, the tone is different for sure. Then the Tampa game, which was kind of funny. That was a game where you come into it, Tampa scores, what was it, 90 seconds in? Red Wings hockey. You're just like, oh my goodness. Like, <sighs> You fully expect that game to just be a beatdown. They beat Tampa a couple weeks ago. The third period of the, that previous game against Tampa is when Tampa had 30 shots on goal. They just went on an insane winning streak after that. The Red Wings went on an insane losing streak after that. Six straight losses for Detroit, and it just didn't look good. But man, the Red Wings grinded that game. That was a resilient game. That was a that was a statement win. Is it going to be like the feature in the Red Wings' eventual run to the playoffs in Stanley Cup? I would bet a lot of money that that's not the case. But I think that was an important statement win for this team to show that they are different from last year's team or the year's previous team. And that even when you know there's choppy seas ahead of them and that they're in the middle of a storm, they can still pull out these wins, and they did it in a really gutsy way with, again, key players being injured. I think before we dive into this game in detail, we need to establish one thing first so that there's some context around this to to make it a, a fair assessment, and that's to talk about who the Red Wings' best player was that game and then talk about the rest of the game after that. Because the Red Wings' best player that game, by far was Brian Elliott. <laughs> okay. So we we need to keep that in 
the back of our minds because the Red Wings won, what was it, 7-4 with two empty netters, so they only outscored them by one with a goalie in net and with a couple of the goals the Red Wings scored. There might as well have not been a goalie in net. And for one of them, there actually wasn't. He he was kind of off in uh, La La Land. So what does Steve say? If your goaltender tend the goal, yeah. If you're, yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's not like the Red Wings dominated Tampa. So I don't want everybody who yells at us for being too optimistic this year to to come at us for this one. The Red Wings were good. They played a pretty even game with Tampa, and ultimately Brian Elliott was the difference. Is the point I'm trying to make here? The Red Wings got good goaltending. Tampa didn't. That was. The deal, but for a team that's struggling, like the Red Wings have, going up against a team like Tampa, who's on an absolute heater, you get that little bit of a break, and you can keep the game even. You should win that game, and that's exactly what the Red Wings did. So that's not to take anything away from them, but yeah. it's to put some very important context on how they won this game. And part of being a bad team is you're going to face backup goalies, and if other teams are going to do <laughs> that, like that's sort of in the barometer this year. We started getting the starting goalies. I was yeah, like, wow, yeah. this is really going well, and then now we're. <laughs> Back to previous years a little bit. I was like, oh, Vasilevsky's still in the league? I haven't seen him in five years. Yeah, uh, But that's the thing. If teams are going to start backup goalies against you, like then that's that you still have to win those games. And what did the Red Wings do in previous years when they faced backup goalies? They still lost. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Comfortably. So, so that's the, the difference. Time. So uh, the Red Wings actually ended up uh, uh, tying the game after the, uh, the Braden Point early goal with none other than Ole Mata, offensive dynamo in front. But the real hero of that play was Pew Suter. Did a fantastic job getting behind the net, stealing the puck, and finding Mata in front. Um, Good on Mata to not retreat and realize the opportunity there. Because how often... I mean, you see defense pinch all the time. But generally, they're either on the puck, around the puck, or they are pinching as they see the pass about to unfold. Mata was in the battle, left the battle... Realized Tampa had completely abandoned the front of the net, saw his opportunity, hung out, and got a goal out of it. Yeah. Which is just tremendous recognition. It's the little it's one of those little things that will go unnoticed ninety nine percent of the time. But in a play like that, normally Mata's back at that point before Suter touches that puck. So the fact he recognized the opportunity just shows what an elite offensive defenseman he is. <laughs> well, I, I think Mata has even said something that like he wants to demonstrate a little bit more of what he can do offensively and he's done it so far this season i mean it's only his third goal so let, let's not pencil him in for a norris folks I, the norris trophy is essentially the best offensive defenseman trophy a lot of the time uh but no he i think he's done a lot there and uh yeah like you said brad really good awareness that play a little bit of a uh a heart sinker as tampa went up 2-1 with under a minute half a minute and a half left in the first and that's the byline for the Red Wings, right? Yep. Like opening games, closing periods, giving up goals when they probably shouldn't. But again, like as was demonstrated this entire uh, win for the Red Wings, they hung in there and Michael Rasmussen tipped in a Ben Sherratt shot with I think like 20 something seconds left in the first period, uh, which was really important because then they came out in the second and Dylan Larkin, who has essentially one hand right now, rips a really great shot uh, moving down the left side. Uh, or as Piranha's moving down the left side, hands it off to Larkin, and Larkin just puts it in the perfect corner. Elliot probably should have been better positioned. I would say that's the one goal that went on on Elliot where I could definitively definitively say probably would have went in on Vasilevsky too. It was perfectly placed. It, high short side right off the bar. There's not a lot of goalies who are are going to get that one unless they're like six seven. And it was a smart. Uh, it was a smart for for Larkin to drive that lane. It was smart for Perron to leave it on the left side. Like that, there's a little bit of deception in terms of where the goalie and the play is anticipating the puck to go. Uh, and then, of course, the Red Wings not a couple minutes later give up the tying goal to Ross Colton. And then the third period is when Brian Elliott started to hand the game to the Red Wings, uh, metaphorically and literally. Yeah, Steve was. Or I'm sure Steve Dangle was watching Elliott pass the puck directly to Joe Valeno and screaming, but Brian Elliott passed the puck directly to, to Joe Valeno, who passed it directly to Elmer Soderblom in front, and again, those guys didn't waste any time. They capitalized on the opportunity. They made sure they took advantage of it, which is just as important uh, as the giveaway in the first place, so Elmer Soderblom, who's been, he's been nice since he got back, uh, got his goal, and the Red Wings went up 4-3, and then the captain, this guy is notably injured. Very visibly hurt. He even went down the tunnel at some point in the game. I think he took a stick to the hand. Uh, another goal. One that shouldn't have gone in 
from the short side on, on Elliott in probably a weird angle shot, but got his second goal of the game, and the Red Wings were all of a sudden up uh, a 5-3. Dylan Larkin is getting paid. Like, or, or Dylan Larkin is playing like, he's playing like two things, and you're going to hear me talk about this with Max. It's a man who wants to get paid, and it's a man who cares about winning. And it's you. how hard is it to lose six straight, see your season start to circle the drain, play injured in a lot of pain. You're essentially going down the tunnel every game and come out with a two-goal performance like this. Nobody was happier that that game tomorrow got canceled than he was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're going to talk about that in a couple of minutes. I hope he doesn't important. shovel his own snow. No, please, Dylan, don't. Steve, pay Dylan so you don't have to. Uh... Yeah, get one of those heated driveways. Yeah, oh, that, man. That's one of the, that's actually his signing bonus in his next contract. I still. I would take that. I still can't believe that Connor McDavid took that much flack for having a heated driveway. Are you kidding? I know we've talked about it, but that is the first thing I'm doing in with Edmonton. wealth. Yeah, he's in Edmonton. The ice has ice. Like, yeah. no, you heat your driveway if you have the. the There's the White Walkers walking around in Edmonton in the winter. Just get a heated driveway. If I had Evan's money, I'd have two heated driveways. If we had Evan's money, we wouldn't be working right now, buddy. We would <laughs> Turks and Caicos. You and I would have so much money, we wouldn't even care about the fact that we loathe each other at a deep personal level. We would hang out all day. But if we had Evan's money, Evan would be out to kill us because uh, there can only be one and all that. That's right. So the Red Wings are up 5-3. Uh, it ends up being 5-4 as Nikita Kucherov uh, scores. How many goals have happened? And then the Red Wings got two empty netters. How many goals have happened with the goalie pulled between the Red Wings and Tampa over the past few games. Oh, every how many times have they played? Yeah, honestly. Uh, Kucherov scores, and then uh, on the empty net, Larkin finds Perron on the stretch pass, and then Michael Rasmussen gets a break. Rasmussen ends up scoring his second of the game, but desperately was looking around for Dylan Larkin to try to give him a hat trick, and Larkin intentionally pulled up at center ice and was already <laughs> cheering and celebrating before Rasmussen even put it in, so it was a nice moment. All in all, really, really, really important win for the Red Wings. Is it going to save their season in terms of like playoff hopes? If anything, like it a lot else hurt, a lot else has to happen. So you know, my my very simple answer here is no. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, is it? Does it nullify the six losses before? No. Is it important for the mentality of this team, the fans, and just the overall vibe going into the holiday break? God, yes, absolutely. Penalty kill was also very good. Tampa went over five, and the Red Wings shut down a, f- a very good looking five on three that that Tampa had. So yeah, that goes that goes a long way to winning that game because I think if Tampa had put a couple in on that five on three, we probably wouldn't be as uh, cheerful as we are today. No, and that was key for Detroit. Like they, you could tell that was a team that was digging deep. They wanted to break out of the funk, and they also wanted to beat Tampa Bay. And hey, two straight wins against Tampa this season. That's a victory in and of itself because. I think Tampa doesn't realize they're in as big a rivalry as they are with Detroit. Yeah. Classic little brother syndrome. Yeah. And uh, every win against Tampa is a big deal because they're a wagon and Detroit's, you know, trying to earn some credibility. So stringing together wins against Tampa is definitely going to help do that. Did you guys see the Moritz Cider uh, Royal Rumble out there too? Well, that's what I was going to bring oh, okay, up. Okay, yeah. sorry. My apologies. No, you're good. Let's uh, let's let's go to I that. don't know who he butt hit, but... They are in serious pain today. That was Hagel. So that he <laughs> he was just you know what in in like MMA or boxing when the guy takes a shot to the ribs and then he just kind of like falls over. Yeah, that's what it looked like. Well, it, it, Hagel got hit twice there, right? Like once by Cider and then Cider drove him into the boards. Hagel's smaller, obviously, as most people are than most Cider. Uh, c- consider like Brad next to Evan. That's the size difference. And then Hagel was falling. And so as Sider was driving him deeper into the boards, he ended up driving his head deeper into the boards. Um, Tampa obviously wasn't happy about that. I think if that happened to the Red Wings, we also wouldn't be happy about that. Uh, but, hey, we just watched, you know, incidental head contact. You know, put quotations around incidental if you want with, with Reeves and Hronik, not get called. So I'm like, well, that that's not getting called. Not a perfect one-for-one one play. Anyways, uh, Sergachev and... Uh, Chernak and some other um, uh, uh, Tampa Bay players immediately came after Mo Sider, and man, he was ready to swing at anyone. Like Sider was ready to go. I think at one point he grabbed a linesman or a referee and let go. Uh, but obviously the Red Wings came into his defense. Sergachev, I'm pretty sure grabbed a chunk of his hair though. The ice crew, I was told that the ice crew picked up a pretty significant chunk of hair off the ice as they were cleaning up after that. That's inexcusable. You. 
You can hit most cider. You can punch most cider. Most cider expects those things. But his hair is one of the seven wonders of the NHL and is not to be screwed with. <laughs> it is. As someone who is slowly but surely losing their hair, you don't touch someone's beautiful locks like that. Cider, for as incensed and as, as like pumped up and ready to go as he was, he was pretty calm for a guy who got a chunk of hair ripped out. I was pretty impressed looking does, back at that. Does Mo Sider ever look amped up, though? His face is usually, like, pretty neutral. Yeah, he he does not emote. Evan, you don't emote. No, I try not to. You're desperately holding back <laughs> a smile right now. <laughs> uh, he, like, ever since the the Minnesota game, though, you, we've seen more and more of that, like, fiery play from Sider. A lot of it has to be born of frustration. Like, a guy who smelled winning and all of, and all of a sudden it's going away. Uh, he's he's playing on, with a new D partner where the results are the inverse of what he was getting with objectively worse players last year. Uh, his play hasn't always been the best, although I think it's been much improved lately. And it's it's manifesting in his physical play and how he shows up in that space on the ice. And honestly, love it. It's perfect. It's exactly what you want to see from Mo Sider. He's not over the line. He's not taking himself out of position. But rough him up. Make your presence known. It's not like other teams take it easy on Mo Sider. They go after him anyway, so you may as well... You know, use that big body and be a physical presence. I think there's also a little bit to the fact that the Red Wings have failed the punk test this year a bunch. And yeah. and Sider just looks like he's had enough of that. He doesn't yeah. want to be the guy because he, he's, you know, he's pretty self-aware. He knows how important to the team he is. And he can't be the one sitting in the box for five minutes or getting 10-minute misconducts. But someone's got to do it. And if nobody else is stepping up, I know Sherratt did against Minnesota. So it's not to say nobody on the Red Wings is doing it, but it's not many. So when you have the, we'll say, physical stature of Mo Sider, he, despite his role, he's a good candidate to do it. So that's the Red Wings win. Um, again, like I said, pretty important. Rasmussen notably on Larkin's wing. That was something that apparently Alex Tangay pushed for, uh, and they also put him there to take Larkin's face-offs uh, as well. They refer to to Rasmussen as a natural center. Is it a surprise that we saw him have such a phenomenal game on the wing? No, he's way better suited for the wing. I mean, playing with Dylan Larkin doesn't hurt. He's also been good at center this year, though. I think he's had a really good season overall. Relative to what? His own standards previous. As a centerman? Yeah. Yes, yes. He definitely was better this year. I will agree with that. He was playing at the capabilities of a fringish third, fourth line center relative to the NHL. So he, he wasn't special. He was well under a half a point per game to that point at center. Um, wasn't blowing responsibilities defensively, so he was doing good there. But he is, it's not a coincidence. Offensively, he pops off the first game they put him, not first game, but they put him back on the wing and the difference is noticeable. Yeah. Because the thing with Michael Rasmussen is, it's always been hard to de kind of describe what he is as a player because he's a ninth overall pick, but he underwhelmed. He had the weird development path, and then he's played center wing. And if you ever need to describe Michael Rasmussen to someone, he is a very, very smart, intelligent hockey player with a mega high compete level who severely lacks the talent to execute the things he wants to do. So when he's able to play a simple, straightforward game, which playing wing allows him to do, he can be effective because he gets to the right places. He will win. He has gotten to the point now he wins more battles than he loses. Yeah. But when you're asking him to facilitate the ice and carry the puck more and distribute the puck more, that's not him. He just He does not have the talent to do it. So that's not to take away from him because, again, his strengths are his compete and his smarts. In a simple role with good players, he can thrive, as we just saw. So I'm I'm hoping Tange is realizing the same thing, and this is going to be a permanent thing because he looked phenomenal in that role. Suter and Valeno again at center are, are having... You know, they're, I think they're doing a good job. Is it always perfect, especially with Valeno? No, but I think you're seeing what you want to see, especially considering the role he's being deployed in. We've always talked about with Valeno, it takes time, but when he gets it, he gets it. And the points have started to come lately. He's yeah. like, by his standards, he's on a bit of a heater the last couple of weeks, and yeah. offensively at least anyway. Okay. Uh, there's so much more we can talk about on this, but I want to save some time to uh, get to our interview with Max Boltman. But first... I want to let everyone know that this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast is proudly brought to you by NordVPN. 
Are you missing out on a game or your favorite show because it's not available in your region? Let me introduce NordVPN. Using NordVPN and a click of a button, you can watch and browse as if you're elsewhere in the world, making sure you never miss a game and can watch whatever content you'd like. No need to travel across the continent or oceans for your favorite team when NordVPN brings them right to you. With over 5,000 server options, no game or show is out of your reach. Using our special link, nordvpn.com slash wingedwheel, you can receive a huge discount on NordVPN's cybersecurity two-year plan, plus four free months. We all love to binge, but privacy is a big deal too. NordVPN keeps your information encrypted, so you never have to worry about your IP or location getting out. They've also doubled down on keeping you safe with their new threat protection feature. Say goodbye to intrusive website ads and malware. Even if you download an infected file, threat protection kicks in and deletes it before it makes a mess of your computer. Don't forget, there's literally no risk to you at all with their 30-day money-back guarantee. Give it a try, and if you like it, great. If you don't, they'll issue a refund, and you can pretend the entire thing never even happened. Check out our special link, nordvpn.com slash wingedwheel, to get your discounted subscription started today. All right, it's time to uh, have a conversation with Max Boltman uh, in our Beers with Boltman segment. Notably, Max and I both didn't have a beer. Max was writing, and I was mourning the death of my laptop uh, which is still getting to me, but hey, it's the holidays, so I'm not going to let it bring me down too much. Uh, we recorded that before the Tampa game, so if you know, notice any lack of optimism there, that's why. But overall, we have a general conversation about uh, the Red Wings season, the cider Sherrod pairing, um, you know, a look forward into what might be in store for the Red Wings that may be at the trade deadline, and a lot else. So without further ado, our uh, guest spot with Max Boltman of The Athletic Detroit. Enjoy. Max, you've officially witnessed me at my lowest trying to start the interview and having my laptop, which pretty much holds my entire life, the whole podcast on it, just die in front of me. An Apple glitch screen will humble us all. There is no doubt about that. <laughs> I, I truly don't see how it could get any worse than this, he said famously before it got worse than this. <laughs> Folks, and that was uh, after I was already about an hour late for this interview. So, <laughs> look, man, you're watching the Pistons. It's all good. Anything to see the teal. I uh, right. I have no problem with that at all, folks. We are joined by a good friend of the podcast, Max Boltman. Max, how's it going, man? It's going. It's going. It sounds like it's going a little better than on your end. So. <laughs> yes, yeah, I think it is. Although the Pistons didn't win tonight. No, not even close. No. Uh, we're also liars because I think we said we'd call the segment beers with Boltman and neither of us has a beer. No, that's true too. And I, and I, I, I got to write later, so I, uh, I can't even crack one if I wanted to. <laughs> you could have lied. It's free to lie on the internet, Max. <laughs> so we have, um, I don't know. It feels like a, an interesting past few weeks that have really changed the tune in the world of the Red Wings. Uh, a lot of people, uh, myself, yourself included, have said American Thanksgiving probably isn't the best benchmark to evaluate whether the Red Wings are truly a playoff team. Let's see how December goes. Now, December's not done, but there's been a little bit of a story written over the last couple of weeks. What are your thoughts about where the Red Wings have landed and what does that mean for your take on their season as a whole? Totally. I mean, I, I agree that that was the whole, you know, the first two months as everything was so promising, there was this kind of like, let's see what happens in December and December is a happening. Uh, it, it has gotten exactly as hard as, as we thought it was going to get. Uh, and honestly, the first little bit of it, I thought they were handling quite well. Like, you know, the Toronto game, I think was technically November, but like they outplayed them. Right. And like Vegas, I don't think they outplayed them, but they played them fine. And, and, you know, I thought they played Dallas fine. Um, to quote Brad Chris, Crisco, uh, they obviously beat Tampa. That. But, uh, this last stretch here, like, it's just the, they can't get over the hump. And I, you know, the injuries are, are starting to stack, right? Like, Mata gets pneumonia. Larkin yeah. is clearly playing through something, uh, unpleasant right now. As he does. So I don't know that it's all even like their fault, but this is the reason that we kept saying that, right? Like, the, the, the teams that do not give you any margin have, have showed up and been exactly that. And, it is starting to look like a very steep uphill climb if they're going to, you know, not even make the playoffs, but just make a, make a serious push out of it. Yeah. And, and something that we've preached quite a bit is that, you know, the Red Wings have had their success and, and that's 
truly well and good, and I don't even mean that facetiously. Like, they should celebrate that. Red Wings fans should celebrate that. But acknowledging how fragile that success was, right? Like, how many times was it on the backs of a, or the back of a, an unreal Ville Husso game? Or they were elevated by just a couple players. And now, yeah, these injuries, which happen to everyone, but other teams are deeper and can afford it. I do think that the Red Wings have had some remarkably poor luck here, though. No doubt. I mean, you know, what's I think it's been especially interesting is like you see how, okay, you survive these first few reasonably well, better than I think I would have expected them to. But the second wave, and I don't know if it's just because of the the volume and the totality or if it's because like you really see how important to this team Dylan Larkin is. Like when he was out for four periods, they scored one goal. I mean, like that, that tells, I mean, it's four periods, but it tells you a little bit of a story, right? And, and you see, you know, Olimata when he's out, what the blue line starts to kind of look a lot different. And I I think those are two little mini stories for you right there on, on two guys who have been huge parts of this team. Not to say that they're the only guys on the team that matter or that their injuries matter more than anyone else's or whatever, but it, it does tell you something about their place in all of this. And, um, you know, I, I think there is something to be, to be gleaned from that. And, and that's been one of my bigger takeaways from it is like, even Larkin's in now, he's, he's playing her clearly. And it, you know, even just his presence there makes it look a little better, but you still see just how much of on a given night, the team's offensive threat is going through number 71. Right. So, uh, our, our good friend Prashanth has been, uh, duly pointing out some parallels between this season at this point and last season at the same point statistically. So it's not even just the vibes were the same. I think statistically a lot of the numbers were the same. I actually think you raised, um, you had a little bit of a trick question in the chat the other day <laughs> about the expected goals and everything. Uh, and so the question is, is this a perfect uh, match or is this a reflection of last season or, or how different is the story and uh, pretty much what I'm leading you to is is what we were talking about a little bit off air is do you see the path forward getting as low as it might have for the Red Wings in the past few years? I don't. And, and I think um, I don't know if I think it was a commenter on one of our stories on The Athletic recently who made kind of the point. Someone was saying, you know, they're in the same place as they were last year. Like, how is this improvement? And the, I wish I had the name of the commenter who said it. Their odds are they are a listener and probably a patron of your show. Um they said like the problem with last year was never the start. Like the problem wasn't where they were after 31 games. It was what happened, you know, the last 40, 45 games. And I agree with that, like wholeheartedly, like that being in the same spot that they were last year at this time is fine because at this time last year, things looked pretty good uh, for a lot of people. Uh, one of whom was Alex Adelkovich, who right around this time of year, I think I wrote a story that quoted, uh, Jeff Blaschel is saying like he looks like a, a number one in this league. And that's how much things have turned in a year, right? Yeah. Um not to I'm not taking a shot at net. I, I am no, still a believer. Just... I, I think I'm probably more of a believer than the average person based on my on my tweets, but it, it tells you like, you know, what overwork can do to a goalie, and, and that's very relevant right now to Vili Husso. Um and and just how much the team fell off, right, from that point. So um, do I think they're going to fall off to that degree? I do not. I think they're actually more likely to stabilize because they're, they've already had this like heavy injury wave. They're going to get Jacob Vrana back honestly way sooner than I was expecting. Um, we don't have an exact date yet, but it looks like he's, you know, we're in like the within a couple weeks kind of thing here, maybe even sooner. Yeah. Um, is how it looks to me from the outside. Um, you know, Tyler Bertuzzi's, you know, you're down into, I think, that kind of last month or so of, of his absence. And, and it seems like you avoided the worst with Larkin. Um, if, if they don't suffer major new injuries, which, you know, I'll knock on wood for, for the listeners out there. I know that's what they'll, they'll want. Like, I think you'll be able to weather that storm better than they could have last year. But to your point, it's a cautionary tale for sure. You mentioned the players returning. Uh, <laughs> Well, what we've seen with Larkin in previous years is that unless he gets an extended period of time to rest, he's not really going to heal up. Like, that guy is a warrior. He plays injured. He's also in a contract year, so for reasons other than hockey, it's in his best interest to play as much as possible. Okay, is it? I was thinking about this the other day. 
if you like, I think he's arguably acting against his interest because this is going to take a hit on his number. He does not look the same. Does not look like he can shoot how he normally shoots. I think his stats are like, if I was advising him, I would tell him to heal, but he clearly wants to feels the obligation to play. Right. And I yeah. respect that. You know what I mean? But is that like even good for his platform? You know what I mean? You know, you make a great point and you can't refute that. And, and I'm going to be drawing a lot of inference on a situation that I know nothing about, which no, almost no one in the world does, which is what's happened in that negotiating room. You think of the kind of GM that Steve Eisman is. He would, he values someone who has those kinds of intangible yeah. leadership things. And for sure, Steve Eisman is looking at a wealth of players right now who are, who are asking for contracts and Larkin and Bertuzzi uh, that have had a lot of points or will be in, insider and Raymond. And if I'm Steve Eisenman, my angle is, yeah, you have a lot of points on a really garbage team. So those secondary assists yeah. don't mean anything to me. And so if you're Larkin's agent, who's to say he's not saying, okay, you know, if you can play through this, go out there and show that you're going to give it your all and, and give that 120 Steve Eisenman type uh, uh, player performance. Yeah, I think as long as you're not risking re-injury, like I don't think there's necessarily like a wrong way to play this or whatever. But I, I was thinking about the other day of just like, you know, he he was so clearly above a point per game for a while, and and he's below it now mainly because he's he's clearly playing hurt. Yeah. Um. And I, that was just kind of sticking in my head the other day. But you make a good point too. Like it it cuts both ways, especially if a huge part of your uh your brand is is leadership and and you know your your competitiveness. Like I guess this this is a way to, of of obviously showing that it's it's why he's. I mean that is who he is. I mean, think, I'm thinking about it critically for a second. Occam's razor dictates that you're right. He's just a hockey player. This is just who he is. He hates losing. And he's, unless you yeah. legitimately bar him from going on the ice, he's going to do it. Yeah. I, I, that's, that's my read on him for sure. Yeah. So with him playing hurt and, you know, Bertuzzi coming back, how long is Bertuzzi going to take to come into form? That's going to raise questions about where this team is at in March and early March at the trade deadline. And I'm not going to sit here and, and say, let's draw out narratives, but, you know, we're that's that's just a few months away. They have a decision to make on Tyler Bertuzzi. They have a decision they'd love to make on Dylan Larkin, but they have less control there. But they have a decision to make on Bertuzzi, and they're going to have people knocking on other players on this Red Wings team. Do you sense that this everything that's kind of transpired over the last month has shifted any kind of priority or would have shifted any kind of priority or strategy for Eisman? I still believe that on the whole... If you told me on the day before the season started, I think it was like October 14th. If you told me October third on October 13th that two and a half months later, the Red Wings would have 30, whatever, 33 points in 31 games, I think they're at. Yeah. I would have like nodded. Yep. I think my, my season prediction for them was 85. So that's like pretty much right in line, maybe even a fraction of a point better or whatever. So, um, I can't imagine. I mean, that's my expectations. I can't tell you what Steve Eiserman's expectations were, but I would imagine not that far off from that. So if that was what he expected, then that's what he's already presumably planning for. Um, but that's the boring answer, right? I mean, the, the take it a level further. Have we seen this team make what looked like a seriously market improvement almost entirely without Tyler Bertuzzi? Yeah. And I, did not expect to see that. Like I've been, I think one of the louder people saying how important Tyler Bertuzzi is to, to the Red Wings. And um, I still believe that like when he's, when he's healthy and when he's right, he's a really, really good player, but it did probably make it a little easier to imagine a future without him. I mean, if I'm being honest um, and I don't say that cause I think that I'm saying like advocating, that's what you should do, but it, that's just kind of the reality, right? You saw this team succeed without him. And that probably does make it a little more palatable um, if you are in the front office to consider dealing him. I'm not saying that's what they should do. I'm not saying it's what they will do, but I mean, that that's fair, right? That's like a, that's a real possibility that, that that's one of the takeaways. It absolutely is. And that's not even considering the fact that there's not been a single Tyler Bertuzzi contract. That's been easy to sign with the Red Wings. There's so much more context here. Well, is that though, is that true? I mean, like this one has obviously gone into the season, and that's, you know, fair. It can give you – the one went to arbitration, but the other one, that came what? after it. Did that really go that late? I, can't I think really it was remember. I think it was pretty late in the summer. All right. And if you consider the length of the extension considering, like, it brought us to here. It got us to this point, right? And that wasn't For a sure. long-term contract at a time where 
I understand like the, the context before that contract was we have not seen Tyler Bertuzzi at his fullest. He believes that the team believes that. And that's what probably why they agreed on the super short term. But I think that went later in the summer for someone who is presumably an important player. That's just my read. I'm sure the arbitration is feeding into that, though. No, it's, I, I think you're making a fair point. I mean, it, the the, his, the contract history does. At the end of the day, they didn't agree to a long term deal when they could have. Like that is one difference. Like I know he and Larkin are hitting free agency in theory at the same time, but Larkin's coming off a six year deal or five year, five or six year deal. Uh, five year deal. deal yeah. Still a, like coming off a five year deal uh, as opposed to like a what was this a two year deal, a three year deal, two years for a, a two year deal. Yeah. So yeah. you know th- there is a difference there, and I think I think it's relevant, but. I don't know. I mean, I, I also think he's going to be an in-demand player. Like that's part of this too, is like, you know, I don't, I don't know that the winger market is as, um, you know, bountiful this year because you probably have names like Patrick Kane already on the market, uh, Brock yeah. Besser already on the market. That's probably not ideal from Detroit's standpoint, but he is a player who we know and it teams around the league, uh, covet. And, and so, you know, it, it's going to be an interesting question for the Red Wings. I mean, it, I I feel really bad for Tyler Bertuzzi, who doesn't, he hasn't gotten to have kind of that uh, statement contract year so far because of things basically entirely out of his curl. Like, you have to respect that his first injury was him sacrificing, like him blocking a shot, right? The second is a complete fluke, him getting hit with his teammate's shot. Like, I I have I have no time for, like, injury-prone on, on this conversation, even though no. I realize he has been hurt because these are one is a complete fluke. And one is like, just like a, you know, res- like serious respect for him for blocking that shot. And you could, well, I mean, hot take player who gets injured is pissed off, but I was actually at that game and I was sitting not too far from where the Red Wings go down to the tunnel. And with how hard he slammed his stick, I was certain I was going to get shards yeah. of, of carbon fiber in my eye. Like he was more pissed off than I've ever seen Tyler Bertuzzi, which is saying something. Totally. He, and, and, this is a huge year for him. I mean, whether whether it was going to be or is going to be in Detroit or whether it's going to be somewhere else, like this year becomes a huge year for for your next contract. You know, no matter how how much you've proven it. And I, by the way, have hated that prove it narrative on his contracts because like he's just kept doing it every time. I don't know what anyone ever wanted him to keep proving. Um, but the the platform here does that, and it and it it's the last message you get to send and. Even if he's back in January, it's drastically shortened. So you brought up players on the market and someone you brought up with Brock Besser. So I'm going to use that as an opportunity to look at a team like Vancouver. Um, There's been talks of, well, pretty much everyone on Vancouver now is apparently available. But Bo Horvat has been a name that has been very lightly linked to Detroit. And I think that's just because of, you know, player connections to the to to liking the team in the area. Um and obviously a position of need. We saw Steve Eisenman move in a direction this past offseason where he clearly wanted to improve the team. He wanted them to win more games, despite the fact that you have Bedard, Fantilli, Michkov, uh, Carlson, a bunch of other guys who would potentially be number one in a lot of other drafts this year. So Eisenman's not looking at the draft lottery. Does that mean this year it would be more likely than any other where he would take a run at a guy like Bo Horvat, who might not be on the market that often, if ever. I think it would not make any sense for them to do via trade. I don't think it makes sense to give up that kind of asset cost for someone, you know, you're going to have to then give a big contract to. I wouldn't think that going after him in free agency would be like a mistake or anything. I mean, you you obviously got to figure out, you know, I think you got to figure out what you're doing with Larkin first before you, you get there. Um, but if you decide you're ready to devote that much money to the center position between, cause they're both, those guys are going to need, you know, big contracts. And, and if you feel comfortable enough with what you have coming um, to know that you're going to be able to build out the rest of your lineup around that, like, I, I think that's a fair conversation to have, especially if one or two of these guys who are going to be unrestricted and they have several of them, um, are going to depart, then you have some money to play with. I don't think that would be crazy. Um, I don't know that it would be like, a, you have to do this, like go all in for this, but 
Bo Horvath's an awesome player and, and he's, you know, does a couple things that they need really well. He, he wins face offs and that's been a problem for them. He's just a great two way player. He scores goals. He's having the best goal scoring season, obviously, of his life right now. But, um, we just talked about it. That, that's a good time for him to have it. So, um, I, I think that would be a fine thing for them to do. I don't think it's something that they need to get so aggressive as to kind of trade for the negotiating rights to do because, um, that's just doubling down on what's already going to be a pricey. What would already be a pricey, uh, you know, contract? Well, they could do. They could always do. Um, you know, you only make the trade if the agreement is in place in principle, right? And they've to a much smaller scale. So I know it's almost insane for me to use this. No, no, I know, I know. But like, okay, so so you do that, right? You're okay. So this is what Vegas basically did. I don't know if Vegas did it before the deal got done. Um, the, the Stone deal, remember this? Yeah. Or if it was right after. But either way, like. The point is you're giving Stowe, in this case Horvat, this big contract, right? That like you're hopeful that they're going to live up to. And then you're also giving up the like, assets Brandstrom, to get him in trade. Right? Yeah. So like if, if I'm saying if you want to take a run at Bo Horvat in free agency, fine. But don't give up. It's going to be a first round pick plus to get him. Don't do that. I don't think you're ready to do that. That would be my position. All right. Now, uh, I'm going to start arguing a point that I don't even know that I believe that strongly, but some might say, yeah, <laughs> big, big for Sean's vibes here. <laughs> so, some may say, okay, you've you've gone out and done all that work this offseason, and you're unwilling to take that extra step to you know give up assets to get Bo Horvat, but then now you're stuck in this mucky middle, like two spots out of the wild card and way out of the, uh, the, the draft lottery. So what did you do this season other than... Giving you know, up my first round pick gets me out of the mucky middle? Maybe, maybe might might make the team a little bit more competitive or secures Bo Horvat, right? Look what they did with Vili Husso. And I'm, I'm insane for using this comparison because it was a third round pick yeah. <laughs> to get his rights. But they got Vili Husso when Toronto and a bunch of other teams would have loved to have had him. And they just skipped the line that way. I get it. But to me, the, the, the need, the urgency is not high enough to justify it. If I can take a run at Bo Horvat in free agency, yeah, I'll call for sure. I'll call. And see what it's gonna what it's gonna look like. But I'm not so all in. This is the answer that I'm willing to give up a first round pick in in what's gonna be. I think there's gonna be really good players available in the 12 to 15 range for the Red Wings. Prospects that I would be you know excited about. You know, it, you know. Yeah. I, I think that's the caliber of this draft. Um, I you know where do they rank in previous years? That's hard to say. But like, I don't think it's implausible to come away. 12 in this class, similar to what you would have felt about, you know, eight, nine in the last or whatever. Right. And I, I think that's, and it's, you know, let's say you get to 10 or whatever in this class and you're getting guys, you might've felt pretty good about a six, seven. I don't know. Yeah, definitely. Okay. My tinfoil hat's coming off. I'm, I'm done my bullshit for now. <laughs> let's talk about stuff that we've seen on the ice. Uh, Lucas Raymond and most cider seasons have been uh, a focus for obvious reasons. Let's talk about most cider. It's been an interesting ride so far with him uh we've seen mo sider play well we've seen him play you know completely off his game and i think we've seen him struggle to adapt to a, a partner in ben Sherratt. Uh we're a good chunk of the way into the season sider has played predominantly if not almost completely with Sherratt. what do you make of that pairing and uh, do you think they've come any ways off of uh their initial kind of disjointed start it's hard to say i i think the pairing as a whole, obviously, like the results are are very hard to look past, you know, and I don't know that I'm going to try and, you know, find some deeper thing there. Right. Um, in terms That's of the Derek pairing. Wilbon's job, but the two players individually, I think you see plenty of like good spots there. Right. Like I, I, I think it's legit. I think I said it from early in the season. I thought a lot of Cider's struggles were were forcing plays and turnovers. I think that seems to have calmed down recently. I think he's looked more like the Mo Cider that you know you want to see. Uh, obviously, he's having to play crazy minutes right now, and and that's something that he did last year that you know was impressive, but probably not ideal for him. And he's kind of back there right now. Um, but I think he's managing that fine. I think he looks more similar to the, to the cider that um, we saw all year last year. Um, I, obviously I think power play one helps that. And ultimately if, if that can kind of be a, a staple for him, that probably the numbers follow, but um, and, and with Sherratt, like I get it. I, you know, people were very worried about the underlying numbers and he comes in and the underlying numbers, you know, 
it's interesting. The Red Wings, I think, seem to feel like there are some underlying numbers on that pair that they feel pretty good about. Um, we know team numbers are very different from what we have in the public. And so maybe that is something worth no. I, I, Derek Lowen's mentioned that before, something about kind of their underlying numbers and feeling okay about that, but also recognizing the, I don't know what you call them, the overlying numbers, the literal numbers, the goals <laughs> numbers, the raw numbers. The eye test uh, of numbers, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Plus minus is basically what we're talking about here. And he basically said, like, there is something to plus minus. And both those guys have rough plus minuses. But when I watch Ben Sherratt, he's doing things that very few other Red Wings defensemen do. Like, he is... And I say this as a positive because in a hockey context, he's bullying guys out there in a good way. Like that is something the Red Wings lacked. You, you see him chase a guy and shove him down and, and, you know, clear the net. These are all things the Red Wings are, are already not good enough at and without him are miserable at. So I think Ben Trout's really important to the team. Um, for whatever reason, that pair has not found the kind of like result success that, you know, I probably expected them to, I, you know. At this point, I think it's fair to say you'd like to see different looks. I, I understand why people are calling for that. I also wouldn't rule out that they do figure it out, though. I mean, it's possible that both of them are um, aggressive players and, you know, maybe each would benefit from a partner who's a little more um, predictable. But I also don't see a reason that two players who, who are that good, and I do think Ben Sherrod is good, um, can't be a good complementary pair once they figure each other out. And I think they've been better. Um, but you know, I, I know I'm not going to defend the plus minus and all that stuff. Like it's, it's what it is. It's, it's, it's real. It, for the second time on this one guest spot, which is bad uh, to quote Brad Crisco, he's come as advertised. Yeah. Ben Sherrod genuinely has like, that's none of it's been surprising. Um, and, and this is coming from someone who didn't like the contract on its own, but liked what the player could bring. So I did, you know, for that little short stint, like what I saw from Sider and Wallman. But if you also look at those player archetypes, that doesn't also make sense on paper as to like Wallman's. Yeah, why not would Wallman be any different than Sherratt in terms yeah. of like aggressiveness, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. So uh, I think in general, the figuring out kind of what the pairings are going to be is going to be an interesting arc across like the next 20 or so games. And yeah. I don't know. Are we going to see Edvinson at some point this year? That's another interesting wrinkle to this, right? Because it seems like the the right side young D are the ones that the Red Wings want the the stable patient partner for. And I don't know that a rookie is your ideal option to be that. And yet I I would like to see Simon Edvinson before the end of the year, selfishly. Uh, a rookie so, who loves to activate and also probably yeah. needs stability. Yeah. So it's going to be very interesting how, how they, I mean, I, I can see a real argument to like, play Mata with Edvinson. And especially yeah. if you're going to consider extending Mata, knowing, you know, how does he look on that side, on the right side, if you need him there, um, would be an interesting thing too. So I don't know. It's an uh, interesting, interesting uh, puzzle you could try to put together over the next 20, 30, 50 games. Okay, I want to ask you about Lucas Raymond, but I also realize that your hat doesn't say Detroit. It says daddies. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this is... Uh, it's my cousin's company. He's a fisherman in Minnesota and he makes his own like jigs and I don't fish, but I thought the hats were sick and I had him send me one. So yeah, that is a uh, daddy's hand tied jigs. If, if, uh, if you got any fisherman listeners, they should go to his Instagram, which I think is just, just Daddy. the name of the company. Daddy's hand tied jigs. But isn't that a cool hat? That's a dope hat. That's an incredible company name. I'm going to get one of those hats. Absolutely. I got I got a stack here. I can send you one, actually. I got, <laughs> I got some for some oh, yeah. friends for Christmas. <laughs> I will be snagging one of those the next time I'm around. Um, I love to fish. I don't catch anything. I almost never catch anything. And everyone I'm fishing with always feels bad. I'm like, no, I just like when people just sit and shut up for a while. Yeah. It is such a peaceful experience. I went with my buddy, um, my, my one of my best friends when I was a kid. They had a boat and they would, we would like get up at like, you know, crack a dawn, go fishing. And just, I just love that you got like snacks and pop, right? That was like, oh, so good. I get beef jerky and like 6 a.m. soda. What could be better? Yeah. That's yeah. that's the life. The fish is just a bonus. You throw it back that's half right. the time. I don't even eat fish, really. So <laughs> I like shrimp well enough, but yeah, I didn't really catch any of those. No, probably not too much. <laughs> Daddy, can you imagine? Jigs. Can you imagine casting a line and you just reel up a single shrimp? <laughs> The way I would lean into that bit for the rest of the day, bringing it home, making a whole ordeal of like deveining it, grilling it. Oh, Amazing. man. 
this is the worst ad ever for your uh, for your cousin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I need to talk to you about two more things, uh, and it's late, so I should get to them. Lucas Raymond, you know, yeah. a meal has been made of what Mo, Mo Sider's season has been, but I, I actually think not enough is being said of how much Lucas Raymond is kind of going through the paces of a, a sophomore star after a really strong rookie season. Yeah, it's, I mean, obviously I think you're seeing what it looks like when the league knows about you and, and you have to keep making adjustments. And I I think that that's probably in large part what's happening. Um, my read on it, again, I, I don't can't speak for, for Lucas on that, but um, I've actually, like, I know the production has not been what it has been, but like, to me, on a night-to-night basis, I still feel like Lucas Raymond makes two or three of the most interesting, like, you know, kind of moves or whatever that I see. Like, he's just so, so smart and so skilled. And, um, you know, it's, it has been interesting. Someone messaged me a while back that, like, they noticed he was kind of, like, falling. And I, I didn't – I was like, what are you talking about? And I did kind of notice it after that, that, that he had been taking a couple spills. That was kind of weird. But I, I just still see so much in, in Lucas Raymond and, you know, obviously him on the power plays where he's going to shine the most, but pretty much every trait except maybe like high end speed is, is there. And I just think he's going to be a really, really good player. And I, I think I know that they've really asked him to be, um, complete and really good defensively. And, and is that part of it? I don't know. Um, but I think he is that. I think you see him, you know, being conscious of that. And so uh, I I think he's going to be really, really good. And if it takes some lumps in the beginning, so be it. He's 20. It's, who cares, right? I mean, I, I know fans want to win right away and, and see it all right away. But on the arc, like, honestly, this is this goes for both of them. I, have, I haven't even moved on what I think either of them are. Yeah. Just because, you know, I, I just think that we've seen the talent and we've seen it in the NHL. And if it takes some, like, tinkering – you know, over stretches of months or even a season, so be it. I mean, it, you can go through a couple of these and in, in your career and come out the other side, and that probably is what it takes because teams do adjust on you. That's player development doesn't stop once you play right. your first NHL game. Uh, Good way if, to put it. If that was the case, then Rasmus Dahlin wouldn't be having the season he's having now. You, Great you example. Or Dylan Larkin. I mean, like Larkin had a long sophomore slump, right? And yeah. and and I think. Lucas Raymond, having been a pro hockey player before he ever got to Detroit, is probably better equipped to to handle yeah. that than than a lot of guys who come up in North America in, in junior hockey or, or college hockey. And so um, he's a really mature kid. I mean, he does not seem 20. So uh, you can say the same for, for Cider for sure, too. So I, I think both guys will handle it. I'm sure there's frustration. I mean, Derek Alone told us that there's been frustration, but you'd almost be more worried if they weren't, <laughs> if oh, they yeah. weren't frustrated. <laughs> Uh, so, I, you know, I'm not going to sit here and ask you about, you know, what are your overall projections for the season now? Uh, like you said at the top, everything's coming in as expected. It just took a little bit of a different path. So I want to ask more of a pointed question about goaltending. You mentioned yeah. very briefly, you know, Alex Nedeljkovic was overworked last season and, and that hindered his game, uh, maybe even into this season. And uh, Vili Husso right now is being able, being asked to to shoulder the load of it. pretty much every halfway important game, which is all of them for Detroit. Yeah. And they have a mess behind him with uh, a faltering Ned and a Helberg, which they don't know if is a real NHL backup. What do you make of that, and how important is it for the Red Wings to to figure that situation out for Vili Husso's sake? Yeah, I, I think it, the big thing to me, like the answer to all of it, is you just have to find a way to get Nedeljkovic going. I, I think he's still the guy you want as the number two. You know, coming into the year, they were comfortable with this being a 50 50. Who so obviously, you know, nullified that with how good he was. Um, but I think that tells you, like, you know, what they saw in Nedeljkovic's talent level um, to be willing to do that coming in. And, and it hasn't worked out so far this year. It's been a rough go. Um, at the beginning, I thought it was a lot of like team in front of him, but it seems to kind of have maybe, maybe made a hit in kind of his confidence and, and just his, his flow. I wonder, like, you know, I wish we had a goalie on this show because I don't know anything about goaltending. And I know you famously were a defenseman, <laughs> um, which I guess is closer to a goalie, but, uh, I, with a goalie who's that like athletic and plays with that much like swagger, like it just seems to me like, that would lend to kind of streakiness and rhythm. And when you're playing one game a week, which is basically what he's had for this whole season, 
Like how, how much harder is that to keep that rhythm? And maybe that's a tough scene because it's like, well, that's the job of a backup in some ways. But like, I do feel for him in that way because it, the the way that he plays when he's on, like, it's fun to watch him. Like he stole games last year and he's playing the puck and he's making the spectacular save. And I can see a where like, it, you know, that style of game is probably really hard when you're, when you're don't really know when you're going to go in and, you know, going to Hellberg in Minnesota to me, like is interesting. I, I, I wrote after that, like I do, that makes me think that kind of the theory everyone's been floating around of like, could they be trying to, basically justify a conditioning stint for him at some point, which would allow yeah. him to kind of get that rhythm and, and get back in flow makes, makes some sense to me. Um, I don't know if that would have any other kind of second order effects on like, you know, what does that do to ask him to go to the AHL for 14 days or whatever, but I get the logic. Um, but I think he solves all of it because he's the guy you want as your, as your number two. And if if that's the case, then you can lighten up Huso's workload. And that I think is important. I don't think you want to ask Philly Huso to play 60 games this year. I don't even know if you want to ask him to play 55, like 50, fine, 50 to 32, whatever. I mean, he's already might be on track to smash that. But I think ideally you want to learn from the overwork that you put Nadelkovich through last year and, and give him a break. Um, but he's got to inspire enough confidence, I guess, for you to be able to do that. And so. I don't know how to get them right, but I know getting them right is the answer to every question you just asked me. Simply do it. Yeah, we, you know, we had Kevin Woodley on the show uh, not too long ago, and he he gave a lot of really great answers on you know technically sound versus very athletic goalies and rhythm and everything. So much more qualified to speak to that. But I, I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of just needs to get in the flow. Um, okay, Max, we are five minutes to midnight here, and I just can't be that kind of friend who keeps you up that late on a work night. So uh, folks, this has been Max Boltman, uh, Beers with Boltman without the beers. Uh, you can find him on Twitter, M underscore Boltman, and more importantly on The Athletic Detroit. Uh, that is, if you are subscribed to anything uh, on the internet that's written, The Athletic Detroit is worth it because of Max's writing alone. Waking up, having a coffee, petting my dog, and reading his work is my favorite thing to do. Just kidding, I read it when he drops it at 1 a.m. like a psychopath. Uh, be sure to check that out. Max, thank you for jumping on the show. And hey, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Yeah, Merry Christmas. Should be, uh, should be nice to, to get a couple days of, uh, of, of an exhale here. Yeah, well, don't tempt fate. <laughs> All right, talk soon. There's man. a trade freeze. They can't do it. <laughs> All right, welcome back. That was our conversation with Max Boltman. Uh, as we took a look at where the Red Wings are, uh, at this point in the season and, and what's in store for them. So uh, interesting. And we'll uh, we'll see how well or how poorly that ages, at least my takes when it comes to uh, maybe trade deadline. But for now, let's get into some more Red Wings news. First of all, uh, it sounds like they've been working Jacob Verona pretty hard in practice. And I think that lends towards what we were talking about last episode, which is that they're not going to rush him, so to speak. Like they're not going to bring him until he's ready. And they said they're going to be patient. But my suspicion is that they are going to, at the first opportunity where they think they can give him even 10 minutes of ice time, they're going to do it. One of the worst offensive teams in the NHL has a noted sniper on the verge of returning. Yeah, I feel like they'll feel pretty urgent. So if they are working him that hard in practices, it's because they want to see if he can handle a game. Um, wasn't They didn't put him in for the Tampa game, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's not too much longer after this. So. Again, given that the game tomorrow is not being played, it feels like he'll be in for the next game. And that's also uh, the next story. So the Red Wings, uh, there's a big winter storm sweeping through uh, southern Ontario, Michigan. Everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. Everywhere. Um, and uh, the Red Wings were due to be in Ottawa to play on Friday, December 23rd in the evening, and they have postponed that game to late February. So uh, the Red Wings are officially on holiday break. They get a couple days extra uh, of rest. They're not back until the 28th against Pittsburgh, uh, in Pittsburgh. And so, yeah, it's nice to have that extra break. And, yeah, it's nice to go into the break on a win. But how important is that for Dylan Larkin with his hand, who's grinding through that right now? How important is that for Ole Mata, who's been on the third pair with limited minutes because he's still recovering from pneumonia or from having had pneumonia? Uh, how important is that for every Red Wings player who's banged up? Like, you don't really get eight days off that often or seven days off that often. And it's really important in my mind that the Red Wings kind of lucked into this. Yeah, there's very few teams in the NHL who needed this break more 
than the Red Wings. And the one benefit, too, about the Sens game being postponed, I mean, it's only one game, but postponing it till February, is there a single Red Wing who's injured right now that's timeline isn't up before then? Which means they'll have, if nothing goes wrong, Fabry, Bertuzzi, Zadina for that game as well, which they otherwise wouldn't have. Yeah, it's two point. It's it's another game into the column of you're a little bit more likely to win. It's shifting two points over into potentially you'll grab these. And for those on the optimistic side of this, we're all really hoping the Red Wings are still battling for a playoff spot. Then, so you could say, oh yeah, well it's one game. How many teams missed the playoffs in a year by one or two points? It matters. Yep. As of right now, the Red Wings have a game in hand on island on the Islanders who have the second wild card spot. If the Red Wings win that game in hand, they're still only a point back. Yeah, they're very much in this. That's uh we've used the negative context of how wide open the Eastern Conference is this year because there's a million teams competing for this spot, but the benefit of there's a million teams in this right now, all in kind of that mushy middle. Means as long as you don't completely fall off a cliff, you're always going to be kind of there. Yep. Like you, things have to go horribly wrong to not be in the mix. So if the Red Wings can use this as a reset, could be a big turning point for their season. And if not, at the very least, Larkin's hand can, the swelling can go down for a little bit. <laughs> Um, okay, yeah, he's just literally sitting at his front door with his hand in the sm- snow pile for Honestly, <laughs> three days. I've had that before where I've had a busted hand and it just the relief you get sticking it in the snow is hysterical. Uh, the Red Wings on, uh, I think it was Monday, uh, made a trade. They uh, acquired Michael Del Zotto uh, from the Florida Panthers in exchange for Giovanni Smith and immediately traded Del Zotto to the Ducks in exchange for da- uh, centerman Danny O'Regan, who is... Uh, for all intents and purposes, a career AHLer, he will be a Grand Rapids Griffin, uh, and that is organizational center depth, not really a Red Wings move. But uh, notably here, Giovanni Smith has a new home. This to me reads like Giovanni wanted a new start, and they he needed a path forward for that. It wasn't going to happen in Detroit. There was just too many players ahead of him. I don't think that Florida is necessarily you know, an easy lineup to crack, but if you're in a new system, it's a fresh start, and hey, they might use you for a little bit. Could have been that Florida just wanted the grit. It could have been that the Red Wings really wanted the center depth. It, it, any of those things. But this isn't a consequential move, and it that to me reads a lot more like this is a they're doing Giovanni a solid by giving him a chance somewhere else. I think that's overcomplicating it. Giovanni Smith, who I love, who we all love, but in the cold reality of hockey was someone in his mid-20s who couldn't crack the NHL roster of a mediocre team. He's not an NHL player. He's just not. I think Florida probably wanted to shed Del Zotto. Detroit said, well, we need centers. So they reached out. They found, you know, Daniel Regan. They said, okay, who do you want? And pick anybody off, you know, this section of our AHL team. Florida probably just went, okay, give us Giovanni. We could use some grit. And that was it. it. I mean, hopefully Giovanni does better there. I like the guy. I'm rooting for the guy, but... Again, the cold reality of the NHL, if, you ha- if you're if you not an NHL regular by now, you're not an NHL regular. And I think he did fine for what the Red Wings asked of him. I think you saw little spurts of what made him a talented enough player to be drafted where he was and, and get the opportunity in the lineup. And most notably, he was brought in for his, his physical game and his aggression. So there were points where the Red Wings had no other option, and he was their only guy to come in and bully and make that impact. So uh, Red Wings fans, I think, are grateful to Giovanni Smith. It's not... If you can be emotionally attached to the player, and that's fine. But in terms of on ice consequence, you're right, Brett. This isn't a needle mover for the Red Wings, not even remotely. If Giovanni Smith was a guy they signed this offseason rather than drafting six yeah. years ago, nobody's batting an eye at this. No. Uh, okay, some other news. Just very quickly here. Philip Hronik is he's getting some more recognition. Um, Evolving Hockey has put out a few models recently. Actually, a, a few different very smart analytics folks have put out a few models in terms of the highest performing players based on different mes- metrics, GSVA being one of them. Uh, and Philip ronick has been among the top, you know, 20 or 30 NHLers in all of them. And Evolving Hockey also posted uh, today that Philip Ronick is having one of the quietest breakout seasons around. Uh, he has 25 points in 32 games, but a great deal of his value has also come from the defensive side of his game as well. Red Wings fans who watch the game know how much of that is attributed to Olimata, of course. 
But Red Wings fans who watch the games also know that that's not all Ole Mata. That is Philip Ronick also improving his defensive game to the point where he's not a liability, which he was at points. He really has come around. So, you know, we don't have to have this massive deep dive on what we already know about Philip Ronick, but it is key. Like, it, it is a big signal when national media, national writers, folks who have a league-wide focus are starting to notice what Philip Ronick's doing. Yeah, I think Hronik's offensive improvement is mostly due to Hronik himself just playing with a little more confidence, you know, uh, doing more of the things that made him good in his when he when he first broke into the league and, and kind of pleasantly surprised a bunch of us, you know, using a new stick probably helps. I think in the defensive zone, the help from the new coaching staff in Mata, that's the difference there. Just because Defense, you don't get better at yeah. by yourself. You have to be made aware of things. You have to be coached on a few things. You needed to be aided by your players around you because positioning is so important. So, you know, I, I don't know if it's Lalonde himself, if it's Bugner, if it's some something else, but they've seemed to made a huge impact on Hronik and then pairing him with a, a really good defensive defenseman like Ole Mata only furthers that improvement. Okay. We have uh, a lot to talk about, although we are getting very close to the holiday break here, uh, and we're maybe going to save the the playoff reform discussion for uh, another day. But for now, I want to talk to you about a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, the episode or the Wing Reel podcast is going on break, a little bit of a uh, holiday hiatus as we celebrate Christmas and the holidays with our family and friends. Um, and so you're, there won't be a typical weekend episode. There will be a little something for you. So stay tuned. We're going to post something, but it's not going to be our usual episode. And then we'll be back with you late next week. It's either going to be late Thursday or early Friday, uh, that we record again. Uh, and we're just, the schedule is going to be a little bit wonky as we come back from that break and adjust into the new year. But this is like one of our one weeks penciled into the year where we have a guaranteed we're, we're missing this episode yep. and with the roster freeze as max mentioned in the interview it's it's kind of nice because the uh the fear of laser eyes steve eisman doing something in the dead of night as santa's working kind of goes away he's probably actively trying to change that rule yeah yeah no kidding uh okay we are going to jump into overtime on this episode of the winged wheel podcast patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast if you want to support the show Give us a little holiday Christmas gift uh, yourself. You get access to things like the Winged Wheel Podcast Discord, which is always a blast. Uh, actually, Prashanth posted a, a chart, a uh, viz today that was inspired by the Discord, so that was really cool to see. Uh, we, uh, You get access to all giveaways automatically. We have two tickets to every Detroit Red Wings home game this season uh, where we give uh, those away to fans, listeners, whatever, and we donate a bunch of them, and most of those are going directly to Patreon supporters. Uh, additionally, uh, you get access to the Patreon exclusive overtime episodes that post right after this. So there are little mini bonus episodes where we let loose, answer all the questions that weren't answered on the main episode and more. Okay. Let's take some questions here before we wrap up. Sean Stephen Cook says, what do you think is inspiring Larkin to play injured? Is it his agent? Just a hopeless leader? Uh, it really makes me nervous knowing he's playing hurt and could cause some real damage out there. Okay. So that's a different take. The, the answer to the ones you brought up is yes. And because hockey players don't like missing time. I they just don't. The competitive ones want to play every game, even if that hand is chopped off. I wouldn't I wouldn't call him a, a hopeless leader, though. I, like, that's what... I take hopeless leader as a good thing. Oh, okay. Because I don't care about context. I don't care about self-preservation. I don't care about all these other nuances. I want to win the next game. That's all they care about. And that generally is a characteristic of a good leader because we've talked about it in the context of Crosby and McDavid. The elite NHL players have a sickness. They're competitive to a fault. They're competitive to the point where it's legitimately not a good personality trait. Oh, these people are disordered for sure. Yeah, it's outside of the context of hockey. It's it's a, yeah, a personality disorder. But in the context of hockey, it's a phenomenal trait to have. And I think Dylan Larkin's got a little bit of that, probably a lot of bit of that. It's why he's the captain of the Red Wings. You have to have that kind of resilient. I mean, obviously, don't hurt yourself. And I don't think they'd be putting Larkin out there if they could hurt him long term. They want to sign this guy long term. So I'm not so concerned about permanent damage. If it was like a knee or something like that, I would say, okay, let's take it easy. Hands are a touch different. Um, Maybe this is just all one like huge flex in Tyler Bertuzzi. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. 
Uh, Joseph Barry says, what are some reasonable expectations going to the new year for Detroit? Better special teams and five on five, or is it something else? Also, Merry Christmas, boys. Merry Christmas, Joseph. I'm happy with their overall improvements on special teams and five on five play, especially on the defensive end. It's not to where it needs to be to be a contender, a consistent playoff team, but compared to where it was last year, it's a very noticeable difference. My New Year's ask of this team is simple. Score some goals. This team is one of the worst offensive teams in the NHL. Like, not, oh, yeah, they're like a, in the like high teens, low 20s. No, they're in the 30s in a lot of categories. They need to score some goals. Uh, I have a little bit of a different one, not necessarily on ice play. I want Dylan Larkin, his agent, Steve Eisman, and whoever else in that room to just sign that damn contract, please. Getting nervous. We said going into the new year, if there's no contract there, we would have to uh, maybe be shaking a little bit in our boots. And it's, hey, it's December 22nd right now. That's my New Year's resolution. Sign the damn contract. Uh, Purine says, in the preseason, Lalone said uh, he wanted to D- Detroit to have an identity of being hard to play against. So far this season, have they achieved this? I'll give kind of the same answer I did to the last question. Not to the level it needs to be but a significant improvement over previous years. Yeah, they're harder to play against. I don't think teams look at the Red Wings and say, oh, that's one of the toughest teams in the league to play against. There are probably some teams that are like, oh, we're not going to be able to uh, to, well, to roll over them like we have in the past. But It depends what you mean by harder. Like the Red Wings are way better at suppressing chances and and kind of deadening the game, as we've alluded to, especially through the neutral zone. They're still not a tough team, but if you can be hard to play against without being tough, and I I think the Red Wings are in that category. Uh, Enjoyer of Bad Sports Team says, so is Tampa officially our rival again now? These games are getting chippy on a regular enough basis that I think we can at least consider Tampa as our personal pests. I've been through this before in another sport, so I can give some very good context to this answer. No. Really? I think yes. They are to us. They don't care about us. They have playoff rivalries. They have playoff teams they compete with. The context I have for this is the Buffalo Bills and the New England Patriots. For 17 years, the Bills were the doormat of the NFL, and their only goal all season was, we know we're going to lose as long as we beat the damn Patriots. Oh my God, are they the Red Wings? <laughs> and they ne- and they never did. And it's like that one scene, um, God, how can I not think of the name of the movie? It's like, uh, Marvel, Avengers, you took everything from me, I don't even know who you are. Yeah, That's Tampa, Detroit. That was what Buffalo, New England was. That's the thing. It's like, to us, yes, Tampa is the biggest rival. We are not that high up their radar because, well, they've how many playoff series, how many rivalries? The Leafs are a big old, bigger rival to them. Florida is a bigger rival to them. Like, they have much bigger fish to fry than us right now. Well, seems like uh, haven't punched them in the face hard enough. You got to get them to, get them to hey, notice. A couple every, more butt checks. Yeah. Every dog has his day because for the last four years, the Buffalo Bills have ran New England's show. And because of those previous 17 years, it makes it all that much more satisfying. Uh, okay, AJ Voss says, with the talk about possible changes to the schedule, how would you feel about a return of the series-style schedule we had in the 2021 season? I sometimes miss it because it, had, uh, it sometimes leads to tighter slash more intense games, and it made the season feel less scrambled. Also, it would save travel costs for the league because the quantity of travel would be cut down. Note that in this scenario, only the series format from 2021 would, would return. Out of division and conference games slash series would still happen. I don't have strong feelings on this. I I didn't mind it. I'm not a huge proponent of it. If they wanted to, I wouldn't argue. If they keep it as is, I also wouldn't argue. It could be interesting, you know, because, you know, you, you sweep a homestand against another team. Like, there's a little bit more of a storyline there. Or you sweep the, the series. That's probably a closely monitored more than it is now because I... Well, the Red Wings have, would never sweep a season series right now, but no. um, maybe you'd pay more attention to it. It's always an interesting thought. I think it's I think it's good, but I want to see some variation still. Like, I don't want to see all of the Red Wings games against Tampa Bay done in, like, two days. Yeah. Uh, I, I would just like them, like, regionalize it a little bit, 
maybe if you the most you're going to play your divisional opponent is twice uh i'd like it'd be interesting to see more divisional games closer to the end of the regular season because they might mean more then um as you're trying to make playoffs yeah or well they're get a better all... draft pick <laughs> i mean with the schedule they've got proposed they've already kind of work towards that a little bit because if you're playing your division more naturally a lot of those games are going to gravitate towards the end of the season so i just i don't want to see them manufacture like i don't love manufactured drama i think you can create the environment where it can happen naturally like good entertainment but i don't like manufactured entertainment um and I know that might just be a naive thing to say that just costs people dollars, but still. And even just thinking about this off the top of my head, I don't think they play teams enough outside of their own division where that could even be feasible. Because under the proposed schedule, like the Metro would only be coming to Detroit once and or twice a year. The entire Western Conference would only come to Detroit once a year. So you're the only scenario you actually get multiple games series format would be against your own division which is only seven teams yeah i think it would be a very light version of this optimization we'd be talking about okay uh we have to go folks we are going to take our little holiday break now please 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 have a safe and happy holiday season uh merry christmas happy hanukkah wherever whatever you're celebrating or not uh hope you're having a a restful and warm and joyous and uh, a safe holiday season. Enjoy the break like the Red Wings are, and thank you all so much for your support. Uh, there's a little something coming to our patrons in the mail, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, but we'd like to thank everyone who has listened. Uh, all of our listeners are sponsors of this podcast, Nord, uh, NordVPN. Our patrons are name-level supporters on Patreon. Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Grand Foundation. Ake for Armchair GM slash Genius, Nick Perks, Terry Driver of the number 69, Crying Ryan, Hannes Banana, Sam Jimathong, Glenn Brabham, uh, Matthew M. Rice, Croner's Left Knee, Brandon M., Carl Brutina, Nana Luski, Chimmy, Chris Ball, Chris P., Citizen High Five, Connor Scovey, Coyote Season Tickets in Tempe, Derek Enstam, DJ Denton, Give Blood, Fight Probert, Red Hot, Ronick, Hassam Al Qasem, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Joseph Berry, Kalen Wood, Kevin James, King Tone, Las Ensaladas Picantes, Marcus, Matt McKay, uh, Michael Bunting's Denture Paste, Michael Edland, Nedelkovic Goalie Number 1, Nicholas Fritz, R.A., Ryan Hubbard, Scott Martin, Send It Seawolf, The Podcasting Couch, Venom, Zachary Rogers, General Andy Bohan of the Cheesebag Army, Sam Bankson, Number 1 Detroit Red Guys fan, Antonio Gracias, Babe Landeskog, Ben Barron, Brad Simmons, Brian Vasha, Carl Thames, Connor Leighton, Darren Fick, Philip Zadiz Nuts, Ronix Handlebar, James Laporte, Jeremiah Dobo, J.M. Rhapsody, John Evans, John Ingalls, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Linda Hull, Logan Burgos, Matt Keeler, Matt S., Loyal Soldier of the Cheesebag Army, Maximilian, Melissa Erickson, Overload the Slot 60% of the time, it works every time, Ricky Bong Rips, The Hodag, Ian Grant, Rob Z, and Aaron Hudson. Thank you all so much. We'll talk to you on the other side of the holiday break. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.